Good morning. It is Tuesday, September the 10th, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much. I'm Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today because I'm the only one who makes the presumption for the status quo. This as opposed to Rush Limbaugh, who is not a conservative, but a reactionary traditionalist. My podcast is about being a true conservative and using true conservatism to beat the left each and every day. My podcast is made possible by Spreaker.com. It can be heard on iTunes, Spotify, Google, and YouTube. My email address is storytimes at hotmail.com, and I am on Twitter at Ronald Hardgrove and on Facebook at The Drill. I started my sociopolitical odyssey as a conservative Republican. Then I became a card-carrying member of the Libertarian Party, and now I am a registered independent and a true conservative. I was taught by the left how to dress, how to act, what to take seriously, and who to associate with. When I decided to vote Republican, I thought that I could act like a liberal but vote conservative and still consider myself a conservative. I was wrong. Whenever I engaged a liberal in debate, I couldn't win. And I couldn't win because I couldn't be taken seriously. I talk conservative, but I acted left. I used lefty lingo. I dressed like the left, and I engaged in petty vice and associated with people who engaged in vice people who used drugs, gambled, consorted with prostitutes, stole, and cheated. It was no wonder that the people around me didn't take me seriously. So, I realized that defeating the liberals and socialists starts with getting my act together, by not only voting conservative, but by talking, dressing, and acting conservative, by refusing to associate with common criminals and 'er ne'er-do-wells, by being aware of and resisting left-wing counterculture, by becoming a true conservative I will not only win, I will never lose. The purpose of my podcast is to share with my audience the lessons that I have learned on how to defeat the left each and every day. On the show today, two words that conservatives should be using and aren't. I will continue where I left off with the book by Vox Day called SJWs Always Lie. And I will also continue with the book by Dan Jensen called False Christianity when I come back. Thank you very much, and welcome back. Two words that conservatives should be using, and they aren't, are normal and stupid. These words have gone out of use, driven out of use by the left. How did the left drive the word normal out of use? Did they use an anti-concept? Yes. The word okay. Instead of saying, that's not normal, we now say, that's not okay. What about the word stupid? It was replaced with the word challenged. You're not stupid. You are intellectually challenged. If you are a true conservative, you should use the words stupid and normal whenever appropriate in your conversations. By the way, yes, there are stupid questions. You should correct anyone, especially those that claim to be conservative, that use the terms okay and challenged. The reason that the words normal and stupid were marginalized is because those words were considered to be mean or mean-spirited. And while the words okay and challenged are not mean-spirited, they are condescending, pitiful, and contemptuous. And I would rather have someone be mean to me than have someone treat me with contempt. When I come back, I will pick up where I left off reading the book SJWs Always Lie by Vox Day. Thank you. And I'm going to pick up now where I left off with the uh, book called uh, SJWs Always Lie by Vox Day. And SJW stands for uh, Social Justice Warriors. And we, we left the book. He had just described a fictitious episode whereby uh, you, an individual, go to work and uh, find that um, some social justice warriors have uh, basically 
um, for lack of a better term, ratted you out at work and complained about you, basically. Filed a complaint against you uh, for no particular good reason, and uh, so now you find yourself in a bit of uh, trouble. They are the social justice warriors, the SJWs, the self-appointed thought police who have been running amok throughout the West since the dawn of the politically correct era in the 1990s. Their defining characteristics, philosophy of activism for activism's sake, a dedication to rooting out behavior they deem problematic, offensive, or unacceptable in others, a custom of primarily identifying individuals by their sex, race, and sexual orientation, a hierarchy of intrinsic morality based on the identity politics of sex, race, and sexual orientation, a quasi-religious belief in equality, diversity, and the inevitability of progress, an assumption of bad faith on the part of all non-social justice warriors, an opinion that motivation matters more than consequences, a certainty that they are the only true and valid defenders of the oppressed, a habit of demanding that their opinions be enshrined as social customs and law, a tendency to possess a left-wing political identity, a willingness to deny science, history, logic, their past words, or any other aspect of reality that contradicts their current narrative. But there's no need to take my word for it when you can simply read how SJWs describe themselves in their own words. This is how one proud, self-declared SJW explained what it means to be a social justice warrior. Quote, Being a social justice warrior means taking on a role in this unjust society in which you don't ask for equality, but instead you demand it. And others see that as the, quote, wrong tone, unquote. People think that they are doing nothing wrong are going to be upset that we are telling them to change. People are not going to think these problems of inequality are significant because they have the privilege of it not affecting them. They will write us off as radical, overdramatic, and insignificant hypocrites. But social justice warriors must not change their tone to appease the oppressor. Oppressors must change, not the oppressed. Being an activist for justice, or a social justice warrior, if they want to call us that, is about standing up to oppressors. The wrong tone is our tone. The wrong tone is the social justice warrior's tone. Unquote. On being a social justice warrior, Austin Bryan, June 10th, 2015. You may not realize that you are an oppressor, but as far as the SJWs are concerned, you are. It doesn't matter if you grow up poor, if you're a minority, if you're handicapped, or even if you can check off most of the victim boxes in the SJW bingo game. If you don't unquestioningly accept the SJW narrative, then you not only cannot be oppressed, but you have taken the side of the privileged, and in doing so, have become an oppressor yourself. I am, quite rightly, hated by the SJWs due to my relentless opposition to them. And due to that opposition, the fact that I am an American Indian and that my great-grandfather was a Mexican revolutionary who rode with Pancho Villa means absolutely nothing to them. SJWs seldom hesitate to deny my multicultural heritage and declare that I am a Nazi, racist, white supremacist bigot who hates Mexicans and every other minority from Arabs to Zulus. Some of them even go so far as to claim that race is just a social construct, which explains why an SJW like the NAACP's Rachel Dolzal thought she could get away with blithely telling everyone she was black for years. Unfortunately for her and others like her, genetic science makes it possible to conclusively demonstrate otherwise. But if SJWs would go so far as to deny the reality of DNA just to disown a bad-thinking minority, imagine what they're willing to do to those of you who lack the ancestry to play the red card, the brown card, or the black card, to neutralize their spurious accusations. Unfortunately, of those, uh, for those of Asian descent, the yellow card is essentially worthless. As in SJW eyes, yellow is nothing but an honorary form of white. The SJW... JW claim to be champions of the underprivileged and oppressed only applies so long as the underprivileged and oppressed dutifully submit to the 
ideological perspective of their self-declared champions. Their social justice ideology can be traced back to John Stuart Mill, who conceived a fifth form of justice that was a factual state of affairs versus the four forms of individual conduct that had previously defined the concept. Mill defined this new, um, new idea of justice in a form that is still recognizable in the demands of today's uh, SJWs. Quote, society should treat all equally well who have deserved equal, equally well of it. That is, who have deserved equally well absolutely. This is the highest abstract standard of social and distributive justice towards which all institutions and the efforts of all virtuous citizens should be made in the utmost degree to converge. John Stuart Mill, Utilitarianism in 1861. As economist F.A. Hayek noted in response nearly 40 years ago, this conception of social justice leads inexorably and invariably towards full-fledged socialism. It's not an accident that the early advocates of social justice were invariably of the political far left. And while Mill can be excused for his inability to foresee where, that, uh, where the highest abstract standard would lead, 26 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the intellectual demise of Marxian economics, the SJWs have absolutely no excuse for failing to grasp the undeniable. But even in Mill's very early formulation, both the totalitarian nature of social justice as well as, ori as its orientation towards entryism were apparent. Note that Mill declares that the efforts of the entire virtuous citizenry, quote, should be made, unquote, to converge to that goal, and that, quote, all institutions, unquote, should be directed toward it as well. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In a time when every church, every elementary school, every Boy Scout troop, every university, every science journal, every corporation, every movie, every television advertisement, and every video game site are preaching the exact same message of diversity, equality, and tolerance, that century-and-a-half-old declaration sounds ominous indeed. Submit or be destroyed. That's the real message underlying the superficial one. Conform to their demands or be cast out. And it's because so many institutions have been made to converge to the social justice cause that sooner or later, no matter what, who you are or what you do, you will be faced with a choice. Either submit to the SJWs and accept their policing of your every word and thought, or stand against them and endure their attacks. It's up to you. The choice is yours. As with most such choices, the right choice is not the easy one. And that's where I'm going to uh, leave this for uh, right now. Uh, I uh, like this uh, book because uh, it gives you a look at the, how the left operates, some of their tactics, and techniques, and I do recommend it. If you want to really get a good insight into how the left operates, don't listen to Rush Limbaugh who says that uh, he knows the left like every glorious square inch of his glorious naked body or whatever. He doesn't. He doesn't know squat about the left. Um, people like Vox Day do because, as you're going to find out later on in, in the book, Vox Day was subjected to the tactics and techniques of the left, specifically the people that think of themselves as social justice warriors. Now, when I come back, I'll be reading from the book A False Kind of Christianity by Dan Jensen. Thank you very much. And now we will uh, pick up where we left off on the uh, book by Dan Jensen, called A False Kind of Christianity. The ecclesiology of the movement does not fare any better. Many in the movement... Oh, and I, I want to preface the, uh, my reading by saying where we were... Give an overview real quick of what the book is about. The idea that um, our churches are... Uh, there's now two types of churches you've got, and two types of, for lack of a better term, Christianity. You have conservative evangelicals, and then on the left, we now have progressive Christians and um, liberal Protestants. And that the, the PCs and the EPs or the LPs, uh, as he refers to them, Mr. Jensen refers to them in shorthand, um, are what the differences are between their approach to uh, Christianity 
and the true approach of Christianity, what's truly Christian. And basically what ends up happening is that uh, he's demonstrating is that the left is bringing their political viewpoints in and using those political viewpoints and various tactics and techniques to poison uh, the church and poison the church members. So, uh, the ecclesiology of the movement does not fare any better. Many in the movement believe the church to, uh, to be something optional, if not something dangerous to be avoided. The idea that one can have a Jesus without the church is extremely common. The movement is horrendously anti-church. The evils of the church are incessantly detailed and exaggerated. When the church is promulgated at all, it is said that it should be as diverse as possible, with a little emphasis on the organization, government, and structure of the church. Often a medieval overemphasis on art and the sacraments is taught. In the area of ethics, the movement is overwhelmingly unbiblical at almost every point. The movement, for the most part, advocates a pragmatic ethic. It exalts secular academia, and as has been seen, especially in the area of evolution, is in the main very far to the left politically, denies the Christian foundation of our nation, advocates a doctrine of slavery that amounts to an almost explicit denial of the authority of Scripture, is pacifistic for the most part, holds to a social gospel view of social justice, an almost Marxist view of civil government, race, immigration, and economics, has a hardcore environmentalist view on our responsibility to be good stewards of the earth, largely denies the legitimacy of corporal punishment, including the death penalty, for the most part holds to a pro-choice, pro-doctor-assisted suicide view of abortion and euthanasia, holds a view of gender that basically denies any absolute distinctions between the sexes, is robustly egalitarian, has no concrete sexual ethic or doctrine of marriage, and overwhelmingly advocates, quote, full LGBT rights, unquote. It is far beyond the scope of this work to refute all of those errors. What I will do is show that the foundations of this movement are simply a mirage. They do not exist, hence any defenses they give for the errors I will not be directly addressing are utterly meaningless because they are based on foundations that are grossly fictitious. And I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. Um, I read this book because I want to remind the audience that the true battle in this country between conservatives and socialists is cultural, not political. Uh, Yes, we may be politically center-right, but with the left taking over every aspect of our culture, including our churches, how long will that last? Back in a minute. Thank you very much. So I have extolled the virtues of normal and stupid, illuminated the tactics and techniques of the left, and exposed the left-wing infiltration of our churches. These are exactly the kind of issues that could and should be covered by Rush Limbaugh, but aren't. Who is the true conservative? He is the person that understands that conservatism is not just political, but cultural as well. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He is open-minded, asking why, rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential. Not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes, he is a normal American. And that brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. Thank you for listening, and have a great day.